Good evening, dear students, and welcome to tutorial two. So in this tutorial, we looked at the aims and conceptions of education. Uh, and if you read your reading, you should have seen that uh, this reading has three main parts or pillars. So in this reading, what you have to know are the understandings of the aims uh, and conceptions of education by different scholars that we are going to talk about, that we talked about in the TAT as well. You should also uh, know who should determine the aims of education and who should control it. So we looked at different uh, scholars and what they think about this. And then we also talked about the aims of education in a democratic state. And uh, because of time, I asked you to, uh, to go look uh, on that on your own. So um, I also gave you some tips that you can use to schedule your time once again you can do what you like but this is just uh, maybe if you don't you really don't know how to start where to start and what to do you know you can just look at this schedule i hope it will help you this like plan so um you should be able to see the links between the first reading and the second reading the first reading, R.S. Peters, and the second reading, uh, Divala and Matebula. So um, if you look at those five main pillars that we talked about in the first tutorial, can you see any connections? How? And uh, I, I really uh, want you to see these connections. And you told me about them in the TAT, and you gave really uh, good responses. But yeah, there are links. Actually, the R.S. Peters reading serves as a foundation, uh, foundational reading that is going to be uh, that all the other readings that we are going to do in this module uh, draw upon. So um, in the first reading, R.S. Peters tried to describe what education is. And then in the second reading, Matebula and Divala then tell us they are trying to answer the question, what should be the aims of education? Again, these are not really like prescriptions. They're just ideas, perspectives from different uh, theorists, different scholars. So when we start this, we start by looking at CAPS, which is the current uh, curriculum in South Africa. Uh, remember, I told you in the tutorial that we are, at least for now, going to say CAPS is a curriculum. So um, the main aim of CAPS, and you should uh, be able to see this as well um, in the CAPS documents, these are explicit, uh, these general aims. But in the reading, uh, they take these ones. They say the main aim of uh, this curriculum is to equip learners with knowledge, skills, and values necessary for self-fulfillment and meaningful participation in society as citizens of a free country. How then are values or principles of democratic citizenship inculcated uh, in this curriculum? This is evident uh, in the social sciences and life orientation uh, curricula. And I want you to look at the words that I've written in bold. Participation in society, citizens, democratic citizenship. So when you look at these, uh, you can see that um, uh, what CAPS is looking at, they actually looking at a much more, um, what can I say, sociological perspective of um, education. And it is according to the aims of CAPS, uh, like you can see that um, uh, education um, should be something that uh, you know that prepares uh, or yeah prepares or hone the skills of um, 
individuals to be uh, to be responsible citizens res citizens who are cognizant of what is happening in their um, surroundings you know something like that so um, in the reading they talk about three main dimensions of education so they say when we look at education we can look at it from a sociological perspective where we see education as something that integrates learners into the norms of uh, the society where they learn to take up certain responsibilities in their communities Whereas in the institutional dimension, so this one is all about attending a particular um, institution to be at school. So it, this dimension of education assumes that education can only take place in a formal institution. Then we talked about uh, the general enlightenment. Uh, we refer to this uh, period in, in class as well as in the Tat. So, you know, it followed, uh, you know, it's part of the scientific revolution. But what's really important to know and remember is that uh, during that period of general enlightenment, people started to, to rely more on their own capacities to think and they started seeing the intrinsic value of education, which is something we talked about in the TAT. They started seeing that education is rewarding and fulfilling simply for what it is. So um, they say superficial knowledge is not enough. What uh, people need is deep understanding, you know, and yeah, and so forth. So, when you look at these three dimensions, you should see that um, the institutional dimension uh, looks really at formal education, okay? These are the pictures from the first tutorial. If you can't remember what these pictures were about, uh, I would uh, suggest that you watch the first video on R.S. Peters. But what these pictures told us was that it's really difficult to define education, to give a single definition that encapsulates all the aims and perspectives of education. In this uh, reading, we are then going to look at these uh, different perspectives. And these different perspectives specifically answer the question, who should control? education and um, we have these uh, four people but uh, as I said in the chart uh, Adeyemi and Adeyinka uh, when you read the reading it's like they are embedded as part of LOC uh, so they are like a subset of that but I tried to make that discontinuity in this uh, uh, tutorial but um, the most important thing is that uh, I, ho I hope you can read there. So uh, Plato says education should be controlled by the state, the government. But when you read um, more stuff uh, of Plato, he actually says education should be controlled by philosophers. He says people or uh, yeah, people in society need to conform to the authority of the state because when they do that there's going to be harmony in society and he says that brings about social justice according to him social justice is when you know where you belong or where you stand in society and you don't uh, try to you know to interrupt or sort of like change uh, the things, you know, just accept that this is how things uh, are, accept the current state of affairs. Uh, so they say the government is the provider of uh, services, educational services, textbooks, stationery, all the funding. And the government should therefore control education, according to them. And you told me what you think in the chat. And then we had uh, the second uh, conception by Locke. Locke says, 
education should be controlled by parents because God has vested those powers in parents. Uh, he has given them that, that capacity to be able to, to decide for, for, for children, for their children, what is good for them. He says children are born in an imperfect, fragile state. He calls that a tabula rasa, which is Latin and actually means empty slate. So a child is born as an empty slate and knows nothing. The parent has the right to choose or to control the education, to control the values or the principles that their children can learn. And he says, uh, parents are under the obligation to preserve, to nourish, uh, to educate uh, their children. And also, he says there's some sort of a symbiotic relationship. Then uh, children are also under the obligation of uh, obeying their parents. And then Adeyemi and Adeyinka look at the community control of um, education. So when you read their stuff, they actually talking about specifically about African traditional uh, education. And they say this should be controlled by uh, the community. And this type of education carries a long sense of cultural heritage and uh, preservation. You can read some of the points from the slides, very important. Um, they say every man or woman, old man or woman, is a reference library and a resource center. That is what they say. And they say um, that an individual then has to use that knowledge that, um, that they have been taught in the community to sort of like give back to the community and educate the next, the next, and the next uh, generation, if you get what I mean. So, yeah, please, please note, Adeyemi and Adeyinka talk about African traditional education, not any uh, Western um, education. Uh, then we talk about Mill, John Stuart Mill, who says education should be controlled by educational experts or an individual has the right to control or to choose what they want to learn and at what time, at whatever time. So um, he says individual human beings have the power to reason and to see choices in life. Therefore, they should uh, have the right to act as they wish, as long as the negative consequences of their actions are only felt by that person. If you read more of his stuff, he even says learners should write tests when they feel like they are ready to do so. <laughs> you know, they shouldn't be forced. He also talks about um, education being controlled by educational experts. He says those are the only people who can remain neutral in selecting the content that has to be learned. And again, in this module, you have to see the big picture and the interlink between the different readings. Now, I just said something about selecting the content of education, which is something that we are going to uh, look at in the next uh, reading. Then, if you read uh, Plato, he says uh, we have minds and we have souls and our minds are connected to our souls. He says um, the state is has the same structure. It's constructed in the same way as the soul. So in our souls, we have rational parts, spiritual parts and appetitive, appetitive parts. Uh, I've written what those parts mean and we talked about them in class. So um, what Plato is saying, he says uh, people, the masses, people like us, you know, um, have um, the appetitive part as a dominant part of their soul and shouldn't really uh, lead or control education. He says people who should control education are philosophers uh, because they 
they have um, the rational part as a dominant part of their soul. They are people who have the capacity to think, to judge, to reason, and to make really uh, sound decisions about education. You know, so we talked about these things. And then if you refer or try to 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 look at this in conjunction with Matebula and Divala's reading, you should see that um, they they're saying the same thing. So, yeah. So if you refer to the slides, they also talked about uh, endurance, you know, courage, all those things. But Again, in normal people like me and you, uh, we don't really have the rational part as the dominant part of our soul, and we shouldn't uh, lead education according to Plato. So um, he says the ruling classes, the guardians, the philosophers, he equates them to gold in society. And I talked about that typology in the tutorial, guardians, philosophers in capital letters. That's how he that's how he writes, you know, to to sort of like uh, to highlight the importance of these people in society. He says uh, soldiers have courage, honor, spirit and equates them to silver. Uh, and then the working class uh, people, you know, what we want, what our souls uh, uh, really desire is pleasure. And we are just like iron in terms of importance. So that's gold for the philosophers, the ruling class, and that's silver for the soldiers, and that's iron for the working class. And then we talked about the cave analogy uh, that uh, Plato used to explain this. And I talked about it in the title as well. And the question, uh, you should really, you should watch the video that was shared on Moodle about the cave analogy. So I'm not going to repeat that. But we said, who took that man out of the cave, the first man that uh, could leave the cave to see um, the real world. And we said, that's a teacher. And we talked about your function in education as teachers. And we said, your role is to transform or to take people from a state of becoming into that of being. And that is what Plato says. So this person seeing the real world was actually the person being educated. And when he went back to the cave to tell the other prisoners, the other slaves that I've seen the cave, they said, no, no. What do you mean you've, you've seen the light? What light? Because we just find this is life, the shadows that they've been seeing for the rest of their lives were on stone walls. They thought that that's really what life is. And then, you know, and if you watch that video, so you could you should see that here Plato is trying to say that people are just comfortable in their ignorance and they really uh, feel bad and, and uncomfortable when someone uh, points out their ignorance. So the implications of the cave analogy are that in the physical world that we live in, it's just shadows that appear and disappear. But philosophers People who should lead and control education live in the intellectual world where ideas remain forever and do not appear and disappear like those shadows. And therefore, people who are in the intellectual world should lead or control education. Those people are in the state of being and people in the physical world are in the state of becoming and should not lead education or control education according to Plato. Okay, so this again summarizes the parental control by Loki, who says God is the creator of human beings and is the one who gives human beings reason. 
the aim of education is virtue. And all education should be in the hands of the parents. So submission to authority of parents is the only reasonable way children can recognize this parental authority which is given to parents by God. And he says parents foster real respect. The real is in inverted commas and I told you what that means in the Tat. So going back to Adeyemi and Adeyinka, so they say the principles of African traditional education, it's just basically five main principles. Firstly, to prepare, um, to prepare individuals to be better husbands, better wives, better children, better sisters, better brothers, all those things that we said in the Tat, and that's preparationism. The second one is to prepare um, individuals to be to be members who participate, have roles in society, you know, know their roles and all that. And that's functionalism. And um, we also said uh, the another aim or principle of um, African traditional education is to teach individuals to be able to live with other people, to share ideas, you know, to just to live in harmony with other people. And that's uh, communalism. And also it aims to inculcate this, you know, the notion of uh, preserving our cultural heritages. And that is what is called perennialism. And it should also aim to develop the person holistically as an individual develop the person spiritually intellectually you know so forth and that's holisticism so those are the principles of african uh, traditional education then we go back to the liberal conception by mill he says uh, individual human beings have the power to reason, to see choices or options that they want to choose in life. So he also says democracy uh, in education isn't only about having the right to learn, but it's also about having the right to approach education in a way that an individual wishes to. Remember, I talked about that to you, you know, I just use the you because I'm referring to you in in the tat, but it's a very informal you and we don't want that when you write your exams. So um, say sometimes majority opinion can be biased and can oppress minority. And we know that uh, when we look at the state control of education, the state itself is politically structured. And you know that politics in South Africa use the majority rules in voting and so forth. And you know that majority rules, you know, they can oppress minority. And what majority says isn't really usually the right thing, you know. So he says exams should be extended to all children and should begin at an early age. Then we have these other conceptions of education, which uh, look um, into um, the aims of education in a democratic state. So you can read John Rawls, who talks about public reason, Sailor Ben Habib, who talks about discursive democracy, and Iris Marion Young, who talks about communicative de democracy. So these three scholars, you know, they they talking about these. They're like more interconnected, but they're just all about um, democracy. Uh, yes, so you should read these. I'm not saying they are not important, but they, the most important one are the four that we have covered. But you have to know these ones as well. And if you don't, uh, or if you don't understand, you can book a consultation and I'll see how I can help you. So I gave you these uh, practice questions uh, to use uh, while you prepare. So um, just to recap, so we looked at four main uh, conceptions uh, of education about who should control education. So Plato says it should be controlled by the state because the state provides the services for education. 
Uh, then Locke says education should be controlled by parents because God has uh, vested those powers upon them, you know. And then Adeyemi and Adeyinka say African traditional education should be controlled by the community. The community knows what is good for an individual. And then John Stuart Mill says education should be controlled by educational experts and also an individual has the right to you know to 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 make decisions in their own um, education then in preparation for the next tutorial i ask you to look at this question so this is what the next tart and the next lecture and the next reading uh, will seek to answer so it's going to answer this question how do you think educational content is uh, selected so uh, i think this brings us to the end if you have any questions you can email me there or